This lesson is on linearization, particularly we're covering objective 1.2 from the course objectives. We'll start by talking about a little bit of the motivation. So lots of systems in the real world are not linear. All right, so we can think of things that are basically not proportional to each other. So that's for a linear system, um, we have some relationship. One variable is proportional to another variable. But there's a lot of things in, in the mechanical world that, that don't operate that way. A lot of things in, in the world in general, not just mechanical, that don't operate that way. Um, and so here's a short sort of non-exhaustive list of, oops, non-exhaustive list of things that sort of operate in non-linear ways. So air drag, um, you can think of a spring as being linear, but at some point it's going to reach the end of its range of motion, all right, and suddenly encounter some, uh, some stop or some stiffening portion of the spring, which causes it to, to exert more force. Um, and so anything that reaches the end of its range of motion is basically going to have some nonlinearities. Uh, anything that experiences Coulomb friction, that's stick slip type friction, um, has a, a strong nonlinearity um, and, and that can cause some issues in modeling. Uh, if you have backlash, and so by backlash I mean, for example, if you have gears that are not totally in mesh um, when you drive them one way uh, and then stop and turn and try to drive them the other way, um, there's some small period of time when the gears are not in contact as they've reversed direction and they're moving toward each other but haven't yet made that contact. That's what we call backlash. And if you're modeling that in a system, you get basically a, a dead zone in the middle where nothing happens. And so you have to treat that separately. Um, we also encounter th things that are specifically designed to be nonlinear. Um, so you can find springs that get stiffer the more you compress them. Um, I think you can even find, I can't recall off the top of my head, but I think you can even find springs um, that incrementally produce less force as you compress them. The same is true for dampers. Um, for example, if you use air uh, as the working fluid inside a damper, uh, you can get some nonlinear characteristics because of the compressibility of the air. Um, even in fluid, if you push them hard enough, uh, you can experience some, some nonlinear effects. So there's lots and lots of things. Basically, anything that you're going to encounter uh, because it has friction and because it has real uh, effects is going to have some nonlinearities. And so a lot of times we can write them off and say, well, it's linear within sort of the range that we're operating in, and so we won't worry about it. Um, the other possibility is that we actually need to, to handle the nonlinearity in some way. Usually we're going to bring it back to being a linear system, but we may have to do some manipulation uh, to make that approximation. So there's two types of nonlinearities, um, and I, I divide these up by the way in which we describe them mathematically. So the first type is continuous uh, nonlinearities, and those are nonlinearities where we can describe them with a continuous function, be it a power law, some sort of exponential or logarithmic function. And the, the key thing here is that that's a, a smooth continuous function typically. And so these things are differentiable. Uh, we can actually write them in terms of uh, ODEs, where a single ODE describes the system, uh, even if it is nonlinear. The second type are discon discontinuous. Uh, and anything that has a, a jump, uh, for example, the stick-slip friction, piecewise functions that we have to describe it differently if it's going a different direction, um, or different speed, if it has the absolute value function or the, the signum function, which basically tells you whether it's a positive or negative quantity. Any of these functions require us to write two separate differential equations to describe the system when it's in the two different modes of operation. And those are much more difficult to handle. We're going to mostly ignore them today, but the, the simplest way to deal with a lot of the discontinuous uh, systems is to simulate them in software, as you've learned to do with Simulink. So let's move on and start to talk about how we handle continuous nonlinearities uh, if we want to do some analysis. 
these nonlinear functions occasionally have special cases, and you probably learned about some of those in your differential equations course, in your math course. And if you're clever and you can find the right variable substitutions or there's some sort of known result, you can sometimes get these to have an analytical solution. As I mentioned just a minute ago, we can also do some sort of a computational solution, which means that we numerically integrate the differential equation to come up with it, the solution for the state variable as it evolves over time. The third method, which is the one I want to focus on today, is linearization. And so the key with linearization is that we're taking some sort of variable that has this nonlinear relationship as I've drawn it in this plot here. And even though it, it doesn't actually uh, form a line, what we want to do is approximate it as a line in some region. And so you can see that here I've drawn in a tangent to the curve. And over a certain region, we can see that this is not a bad approximation of the actual function. And if we get even narrower, we can see that in a, in a pretty tight region, this does quite a good job of describing the function. And so this we can actually do. We have a mathematical formulation that describes this. Um, and that's the Taylor series, which is basically the terms of the Taylor series start out with a constant, which is the value of the function. Let me see if I can get rid of a couple of these things here a value of the function at this particular point where we're trying to linearize. And so that takes on the value, the dependent variable. Um, the independent variable is set by whatever operating point we want to use. So if we're, for example, using some sort of a spring, um, we want to know in, as it sits in the system, it's compressed to some length, and we're going to operate very close to that compressed length. Um, what is that length? That's going to set our independent variable. So we get the first term in the Taylor series just by evaluating the function at that point. The second term of the Taylor series is the slope of the line that passes through that point. And we do that by evaluating the derivative at that point, and that gives us the slope. Um, and then it's a simple matter of tacking on um, a distance that we've gone in some direction. Let's see if I can do this there. Uh, distance that we've gone in some direction along that slope. And so um, the Taylor series ends up telling us, let me jump to the next slide here. Uh, the Taylor series basically gives us the value of the function, the value of the slope, and how far we've gone along that slope. And if we cut off the Taylor series at this point and get rid of the rest, then we end up with this expression here, which is an approximation of the nonlinear function in what we would say the neighborhood of A or the neighborhood of the operating point. And we see that for various different functions, this works either pretty well or pretty poorly. And it depends on how strong the nonlinearity is. So we see on the, the left-hand plot here that the nonlinearity is pretty strong and that you don't have a very large region, um, as I've noted it here, very large region in which this function is, is a good approximation. But if you have the, uh, the curvature, the, the nonlinearity is relatively small, then you see that this actually works over a pretty wide range. And so what's large or what's small is, is sort of an arbitrary thing, and it takes a little bit of, of practice and a little bit of experience to, to do this. Um, a lot of times it's worth just doing some, some point-wise analysis for your system after you've done the linearization. Just evaluate how close you are to the, to the actual original nonlinear function. If it's close enough, then you can go ahead and use it. If not, uh, you need to move on to something else. So that's sort of the theory behind this. Now I want to move on and a little bit about the why. All right, why would we actually go about doing this linearization? And the answer is that there's there's a few different reasons. Um, sometimes it's a pretty good approximation, and we can take a nonlinear function, approximate it with a linear function, 
and have something that's a really good model that works for us. Um, and there's a lot of theory that we're going to study in the rest of this class for linear differential equations that we can then apply to the nonlinear system and it'll work over a reasonable range. And so there's, there's kind of a, a reasonable um, motivation for doing that. The second option is that maybe this is a first pass kind of model. Um, you don't want to get into the complexity of the nonlinear models. You don't want to build a, a uh, Simulink diagram or you don't want to, to do the numerical integration. Um, so at this point, you've decided that I'm going to start and do what I can do easily and then move on from there. And so you might choose this as your first attempt. Third is that you don't have a choice. Um, for some reason, uh, you might be using some control technology or some, some control algorithm that requires you to have a linear model. And at that point, you're just going to accept the fact that you have error in your model. Um, it's going to be sort of unmodeled dynamics that you're leaving out by not including the, the nonlinearity non of the system. But you don't have a choice. And so you're just going to accept that that's what it is. So let's take an example of this. All right, so we've got a mass spring damper system. All right, and the only difference here is that instead of treating the spring as a linear spring, we're going to assume that it has some cubic form. Okay, um, and so the force in the spring is going to oppose the motion. So we have our negative kx term here. And that's the linear portion of this, but we're also going to have a negative bx cubed. And that's going to make this spring basically stiffen uh, as it goes. And we're assuming that here that um, b, or, or actually beta, is some sort of positive constant. Uh, likewise, uh, k is considered to be a positive constant. And so we take this and use our standard uh, expansion, or our standard process here. And so we're going to draw a free body diagram. All right. Again, this should be getting really easy, but we're going to have the weight of the, the mass hanging down, and we're going to have the spring and the damper forces up, assuming that we're writing those as if they're in tension. From there, it's straightforward to write the force balance. We have the mass times acceleration on the left-hand side of the equation, and on the right-hand side, we have the spring force and the damper force acting in the positive x direction. You'll see that I drew my positive x direction here. And we have the weight acting downward. We can expand the spring force uh, using the relationship that we had, negative kx plus um, beta x cubed. Um, and you'll see that I actually switched signs here. It doesn't matter much, um, but Note that there is a, a change in sign there. Um, we're going to subtract off the, the damping as well. Um, so damping is going to oppose the velocity. Um, when I wrote this example up originally, I was using a book that used C for damping constant instead of B. So just note that that is a damping constant in this term here. And then we have our mg. So we've got our nonlinear uh, description of the system. And so now we want to move forward on this. So the spring force is the nonlinearity here. And you see exactly the form that we have. Uh, if we had a linear spring, we would have some operating point, um, which would be delta moved away from the spring's initial operating, or the initial unstretched condition. Um, it would stretch a delta, and that delta would be enough force along the spring, uh, spring curve to produce a force equivalent to mg. And so this would be, represent an equilibrium point where the spring force and the weight of the mass were balanced out. We can do the exact same thing with the nonlinear spring. Uh, it's just a slight bit more complicated. Again, we have the spring. It's going to going to extend to some value delta. That's going to be enough to cancel out the, the weight of the mass. And that point is going to lie now on this cubic curve as opposed to the, to the linear spring. 
So we're going to go ahead and do the Taylor series expansion um, about this operating point. All right, and so therefore we're going to end up with, let me draw this in a different color, some sort of a line that, that wasn't very good, that should be tangent to the uh, cubic function at the operating point. We can do that using the series expansion, which is our mathematical framework for this. And you see, oops. And you'll see that here we have our original differential equation. Um, and then we have the Taylor series approximation. That is right here. Um, our Taylor series e expansion about the x naught operating point, which we said was going to be our equilibrium. We can do a little bit of manipulation of that equation, come up with something that's in two terms with the x naught and the x value. And then we can substitute that back into the equ original equation. And what we find is that we've got now um, something where we do a little bit of algebra. Um, so we do the direct substitution first. Once we do the direct substitution, we pull out the different terms, all right, and we can actually group those terms. So we have the um, constant terms, such as this one right here, um, as well as the term here that's dependent on x. And remember also that the, we had a term that was kx. And so in total, um, we can put the k and the, and the 3 beta x naught squared term together. And what that is is basically the slope of our spring constant or our effective spring constant in the neighborhood of x naught. So now we're treating it as if we have that linear spring. The only difference is that we've collected an extra term on the right-hand side of the equation that represents the fact that we're not operating around the unstretched operating point of the spring, but some sort of equilibrium. We put that all together um, and we end up with this result here. So I've copied the equation, the result that we had on the last slide over. And so now we're looking at the linearized version of the equation. We have the whole thing written in terms of x, um, and we've gotten rid of the nonlinear terms. So this is a pretty good result, but it's not quite there. This is not maybe the most convenient representation that we could use. Because we've linearized about x naught, what, what we're assuming is that our operation is going to be close to that point, and it's actually useful for us to keep, it, keep that as a measurement. So we'd like to express this instead of in terms of x, which is the distance away from the origin where the spring was unstretched, we'd actually like to know how far we are away now from the equilibrium point at which we chose uh, to, to write this expansion. So what we're gonna do is use a change of variables for this in order to get an expression that we want to use. And so we will take delta x and set that equal to x minus x naught. And so if we've gone a little positive distance away from x naught, then delta x will be small and positive. If we've gone a little distance less than x naught, um, then x will be less than, than the value of x naught, and this will come out as delta x being a little bit negative. And so now we're tracking our position relative to x naught. You occasionally see this as well, depending on who you talk to, what textbook you use, uh, you may see this written as something like x hat, which is perfectly acceptable as well. Um, and similarly, um, x naught is sometimes written as something like x bar, which would be the constant portion, and the hat would be the changing portion, um, or the, the delta. So we can take this expression now, and we can use it in our equation simply by rewriting it in terms of x, and so we'll say x, is equal to 
x naught plus delta x. And so now we have an expression for x that we can substitute into our dynamic equation, and then we can work this around and get it uh, in terms of delta x. So let's go ahead and do that now. Okay, so you can see that I've now written this out where I've expanded each x term uh, into x naught plus delta x. And so now we can go through this equation and start to simplify things a little bit. First of all, we should recognize that the derivatives simplify because we're taking the derivative here of something that's a constant plus a changing value. And so the derivative of the constant portion, x naught, is going to be zero. And so that just drops out of the equation. Likewise, we also have an x zero in the derivative here. Whether it's a first derivative or a second derivative, it doesn't matter. It's going to drop out. And so we can get rid of two terms uh, immediately like that. Now, um, in the first term, the m d squared dt squared delta x is in terms of delta x. Same thing, we're going to have c d d d d t delta x in the second term. And so in the third term, um, as we typically do with our differential equations, we want all of our state variable on one side and then all of the forcing function on the other side. So we're going to do one more manipulation here. And we're going to pull all of the terms that don't have a delta x over to the right hand side. So it's basically going to be one product or one term of the product um, of this expression here is going to end up on the right hand side. So I'll do that now. All right, so now I've shifted the terms to the right hand side uh, and then I multiplied through in combined terms. And so we end up with the forcing function being a minus mg minus kx naught minus beta x naught cubed. So we're almost there. The only thing is that we recognize, or you may recognize, that there's still sort of an equilibrium term hanging around in here. And so you should see that because we've got an mg, and then we've got a negative uh, kx naught basically negative the quantity kx naught plus beta x naught cubed, which is the description of the spring function, the nonlinear spring function at the operating point. So in order to, to take a look at that and see if we can eliminate some of the terms, what we want to do is actually go back to the original nonlinear differential equation and look at it in equilibrium at that operating point. So we're going to write this out. And what we have now is our original differential equation. And we're going to then note that the x's are going to be x naught if we're at equilibrium. And also, there's going to be no change in x. Uh, whether it's x naught or x, it doesn't matter. Um, we're at equilibrium. So we can call these x naught or we can call them x, but either way, they're not changing, so those derivatives are zero. And so what we find from this is a relationship that uh, kx naught plus beta x naught cubed is equal to negative mg. And so therefore, if we were to take this and substitute it back in to our linearized differential equation here, we would see that all of these terms are actually going to cancel out. And so our final form of our differential equation is going to be the following. And there you have it. The final linearized differential equation expressed in coordinates that make this uh, a description of the perturbations about the operating point x naught. And so the variable delta x expresses how far away we are from that operating point. 
We can then keep track of that, and if we get too far away from the operating point, we would expect that this model would start to encounter some, some issues in terms of accuracy. But if we stay pretty close to the operating point, this should work pretty well. That's it for linearization and then uh, writing the equations of motion in terms of perturbations. Um, once you finish this, take a look at the other video where I go through an example of linearizing the aircraft equations of motion, an opportunity for you to also try to do this.